Welcome back, everyone. My name's James Reeves. You're watching TFB TV. This is episode two of Rating the Guns from Heat. Of course, we're talking about Michael Mann's 1995 masterpiece, which featured dozens of different guns used by some of the biggest actors of the 1990s. It's hard to believe that this movie is 25 years old, and it's also hard to believe that some of you ungrateful pieces of shit said that Heat was too long and too boring in the comments to the last video. So be sure to tune in next week where I take a crap on your favorite shitty anime with its weird child protagonist or whatever. For episode one, we just talked about the pistols from the film. In this episode, we're going to rate the rifles, shotguns, long guns of this movie. There's going to be a little bit of spin though this time. Last time, I graded them from F to S on a grade scale. This time, I'm going to rank them from worst to best. Unlike with the handguns video, pretty much every long gun is tits. Heat's like long gun porn, not like gun skinamax, but full pen, your wife left you alone in the hotel room for 7 to 10 minutes, dark web gun porn. They're all really good, and it would have been really hard to do a video where I graded them from A to F because there really aren't any bad long guns. Now, talking about the long guns used by Macaulay's gang, it would have made the most sense if everybody on the crew would have just used the same rifle. That means the same magazine, same manual of arms, same parts, same accessories. If you were robbing a bank with a bunch of other like-minded and motivated venture capitalists, wouldn't you want to use all the same magazines or at least the same ammunition? Instead, we've got Galils, we've got FALs, AKs, M16s, all in the same crew. Now that's what I call diversity. Michael Mann's a gun guy, and certainly he would have wanted to make this movie with this dramatic twist, like giving main characters their version of Mjolnir or Sting. Trademark weapons that would distinguish the characters from each other and make them unique. As I mentioned in the last video, Macaulay's crew changes out weapons a few times in the film. After the opening armored car scene, one of the detectives mentions that the suspects torch the guns that they used in the heist along with everything else. This is an entirely believable way to use a bunch of different guns in the movie and it not be weird or impractical. Much of the focus when you're talking about the guns of the movie heat centers around the climax of the film, the bank heist. The bank robbery scene is only 10 minutes of the film, but it took six weeks of filming on weekends only in downtown Los Angeles with the production team busting off a thousand rounds of blanks for every take. Fortunately, they were doing this in downtown Los Angeles, so no one was really surprised by constant gunfire in the streets all weekend. Michael Mann enlisted the help of actual British SAS commandos as advisors for the film, making the gunfights reasonably accurate from a technical perspective. There's a nod to this fact when Shaherless makes that famously slick reload during the bank heist scene where the car he uses as cover has the plate number 2LUP382, British Army jargon for lying up position. 2LUP indicated this was the second lying up position for Shaherlis to take cover, the first being behind the green car. Michael Mann also hired LAPD as consultants in the film, and many of those LAPD officers were equipped with H&K MP5s and various pump shotguns, so we'll go ahead and start the list off with a tie. This should be a testimony as to how good the long guns in this movie are. The bottom of the list is going to be a tie between the venerable H&K MP5 submachine gun used by the LAPD SWAT in the movie and Remington 870s and Mossberg 500s used by beat cops and detectives. So let's talk about why we're placing some of my favorite guns at the very bottom of this list. The H&K MP5 is, of course, one of the most famous submachine guns ever made, and it was high-tech when it was introduced in 1964. Chambered in 9mm, it's controllable in full auto, and it proved its worth in close-quarter combat time and time again around the world. But you know what else was introduced in 1964? The 223 caliber and the Colt AR-15. This new caliber, this new platform, quickly ate up the space occupied by the H&K MP5 as guns like the Colt Commando came out and became more popular and more technologically advanced in rapid time, giving the operator rifle capabilities in a submachine gun size package almost right after the AR-15 and the M16 were introduced. While the Smooth as Silk MP5 might work well for SWAT taking down your average Nimrod, hey, for well-armed and armored-up rifle-toting pros in longer-range urban environments, the MP5 might not be your best choice. 9mm probably isn't going to cut it. Same with shotguns. Yes, buckshot is absolutely devastating against 
Horatio J. Crackhead Esquire, but even slugs won't penetrate most body armor, and a shotgun's effectiveness with buckshot especially rapidly dwindles at range. As a very real-life lesson for this, straight out of heat turned to 1997's North Hollywood Shootout, where two experienced bank robbers came close to successfully robbing another bank and getting away with it, but they won the room temperature participation prize instead. The men robbed the NoHo Bank of America with full auto AKs and immediately engaged the LAPD at a range of about 60 meters. The police, armed with shotguns, 38s, and 9mm, were overheard on the radio at one point, considering the option of letting the men go because they couldn't stop them. One of the robbers was shot nearly 30 times and stayed in the fight. The engagement did not end until SWAT showed up 20 minutes later, and this baller with a proper urban loadout of AR-15 and short shorts showed up and put the kids to bed. Over 2,000 rounds were fired in this engagement. The less than 1,000 rounds fired by law enforcement were mostly 9mm, 38, and 12 gauge that couldn't penetrate the homemade body armor worn by the robbers. So I'm not saying it. It's history saying it. Pistol calibers and shotguns don't work in the context of a Los Angeles bank robbery with robbers who are equipped with long rifles and body armor. Oh, and can we talk about how breaching this door with two slugs like this would have made Al Pacino a sign language speaker had this been done in real life. For our next gun, one of my favorite scenes from the film. Remember when Van Zant tries to double cross Macaulay at the movie theater so he sends the lead singer from System of a Down and a mildly irritated CPA courier to do the job? As soon as things go south, discount Will Ferrell leaves his buddy behind and he thinks he's gotten away scot-free. That is until Chirito Cobains him with one of the baddest tactical shotguns ever made, the Benelli M3 Super 90. The Italian-made Super 90 family of shotguns is the standard by which all other semi-automatic shotguns are measured. They're not cheap with an M3 costing you about 1600 bucks, but you pay for quality. The M3's claim to fame is it's a convertible. The user can decide if he wants to operate the gun in pump or semi-automatic mode. This is an extremely uncommon feature in a shotgun, but it's great to have. You can go pump if you want to ensure near-perfect reliability or if you're using beanbags, something like that. Or you can go semi-auto if you want a faster rate of fire and to soften up hard recoiling rounds. Torito goes a pumping and a dumping, absolutely bodying this courier and cleaning up the mess that the two HKs, the USB and the HK91, couldn't clean up in the drive through The Benelli M3 is a top-tier gun and probably one of the best guns from the film, as it remains still at the top of the heap in its class today, unlike many of the guns from Heat. But because of its limited range, capacity, armor penetration, and capability like we just talked about, it still has to be near the bottom of this list. Here's where things start getting tough, because we've only got badass semi-auto rifles left to sort out, and they're all really good. So let's go back to that drive-in scene. The assassin's put down by Shaherlis using an HK-91. The HK-91 is a proven 308 battle rifle made by H&K in Germany. Only 48,000 of these were imported into the United States before they were banned by executive order in 1989. Now, US-made clones are readily available, including the usually excellent PTR-91. The HK-91 is actually a good choice for Overwatch duty that Chaherlis is pulling right here because it's got good accuracy, great power, great range from the 308 round. Well, it's a little heavy, yes, at 11 pounds. It doesn't matter if you're prone like Chaherlis is. In fact, the weight will probably help you stay on target. It's not quite precision rifle accurate, but the HK-91 is the foundation upon which the famous PSG-1 sniper rifle is built. So it's going to be accurate enough for this scenario in the movie. Moreover, unlike traditional bolt-action sniper rifles, the 91 semi-auto giving you a much faster rate of fire than a bolt-action, and it came in handy as things went downhill, and Chaherlis had to go to standing to take a few cracks at this escaping truck. In addition to the weight, the scene exposes another weakness of the HK-91. Shitty optics mounting options. Today, we've got plenty of scope mounts for the HK-91, but in the mid-1990s, options for mounting optics were limited. Chaherlis is just using iron sights in this scene, which might explain why he let the getaway driver escape inadvertently. Finally, unlike the FAL, the HK-91 does not have adjustable gas, so you can't tune the gun for the ammo you're using. Ultimately, 308 is probably overkill for most of the film. The additional power and range is nice, but the additional weight of the 308 platform and its ammo make the additional recoil 
probably not worth it. Bear in mind that a combat loadout of a 308 rifle and 180 rounds of ammunition is going to be 10 to 12 pounds heavier than 180 rounds of ammunition M4 combat loadout, which is one of the main reasons why the U.S. military swapped from 308 to 556. So, unfortunately, the next gun on the list is the FNFAL. Apologies to my fraternity brother, Preston, who told me that if this wasn't the top gun on the list, he was unsubscribing. Sorry, buddy. While the bank scene gets all of the gun fanfare from this movie, the armored car scene at the beginning is pretty cool and has some legit hardware, too. Probably my favorite combo from the entire film is from old The Action is the Juice Chirito, played by Tom Sizemore. He was one of my favorite characters, so I hated to see him get bodied by stupid Al Pacino and his stupid Belgian raspberry waffle gun. However, I found some solace in knowing that he probably died a happy man with a Galil in one hand and a hostage child in the other. Part of the reason why I like Chirito so much is his impeccable taste in firearms. And it's during the armored car heist that Chirito's using a great combo of two of my favorite guns, the Ruger P-Series pistol and the FNFAL. Back in college, Preston and I started with sketchy Imbel gear logo upper and lower builds. I eventually graduated into a full set of STG 58 parts kit guns and 16, 18, and 21 inch variants, and I really miss my 18, and that's one of the guns that I regret selling the most. The FAL is arguably the grandfather of every sophisticated short stroke piston system rifle. While there were certainly predecessors, the system used by the FAL and even the FAL itself is still used today. Next generation firearms like the MCX, most piston fired AR-15s and M16s, the Steyr AUG all use a very similar gas system to the FAL, a gun that was invented in the 1940s. It even has adjustable gas, which is, in my opinion, what gives it an edge over the HK-91. It's truly a legendary rifle, but I've got to question Torito's use of this gun for a simple armored car robbery. He could have gotten a shorter version, but he's still using the big chungus 21 inch variation, although with a paratrooper conversion, which basically gives it an internal recoil spring and a folding stock instead of the traditional fixed stock. It's still way too large of a rifle to use for Mozambiquing a security guard from three feet away, though. For the famous bank heist scene, Torito elects to go with a Galil arm. The Galil was Israel's answer to the AK 47. The FALs the Israelis were using didn't perform as expected. Israel noticed, however, that their belligerent neighbors, their AK-47s, thrived in the dirty, dusty desert environment. Rather than merely adopting AK-47s, the Israelis sought to improve upon them, and they also chambered it in 223, the same caliber as the M16 instead of 7.62-39. More or less, this gun is a refined AK-47 known for excellent reliability. Perhaps this shared heritage is why Michael Mann incorrectly refers to the Galil as a 7.62mm gun in the director's commentary for the film. Torito shows us why the Galil makes an excellent choice for a bank heist. Unlike the M16 variants used by Shaherlis and Macaulay, the Galil has a recoil spring that isn't in the stock, meaning that Torito had the only folding stock rifle during the bank heist, making it easy for him to fold up and conceal his rifle while still having a full-length barrel that would give him great ballistic performance. FYI, there's an error in the movie because a couple of the cuts from the bank, inside the bank, Torito has no stock attached to his gun. While the folding stock and 16-inch barrel combo is nice, it does bite him in the ass a little bit when they're in the getaway car, and you see a full-size Galil barrel awkwardly hanging out of the car window as it drives away. It probably would have been much more difficult to aim in a maneuver with that longer barrel around the inside of a car with that stock deployed and three other dudes in it, while Macaulay is sitting there going bananas and spreading the love with his Colt Commando every which away, the Galil is also a bit heavy at almost 10 pounds, nearly twice as heavy as the M16 Commandos used by his colleagues for the robbery. Next gun, Danny Trejo plays Trejo in the movie. True story, this was Danny's first movie, and he was somewhat of an afterthought. If you watch the opening credits, his name isn't even listed. Michael Mann actually brought him in as a consultant because he was formerly a prisoner of Folsom, like some of the gang from Macaulay's crew. But Michael Mann liked Danny Trejo so much that he featured him in the film and kicked off his illustrious career. Although he never gets to use it, Trejo is shown briefly with an AK-47, specifically a Type 56 Norinco. I don't know if you guys have ever f***ed with one of these, but my God. For some reason, it's like the Chinese can't manufacture 
anything that doesn't break within three weeks of use and also give you cancer at the same time. But for some reason, they can pop out some pretty good kami carbines. I've had several opportunities to purchase Norinco Mac 90s in the past, and I absolutely want to kick myself for not doing so. The Type 56 is actually one of the most common AKs in battlefields across the globe, even in the Middle East. Iran and Iraq bought large quantities of them, and China supplied the Afghanis with them during the Soviet-Afghan War. These are proven fighting rifles and over a half century of battle testing. Sure, it's only on screen for a split second or two, and it doesn't get fired in the movie, but for the type of urban setting that most of the action takes place in in the film, the AK would be phenomenal. The 7.62-39 round doesn't have quite the range as the 5.56 fired by the Galil or the M16, but it doesn't need it, and it packs a serious punch inside of 100 yards. The AK shoots a round that's slower and shorter range than the M16, but the round weighs twice as much as a 62 grain 223 round and delivers 20% more energy than an AR-15 inside of 100 yards, although at 200 yards they start to even out. The AK is also typically less accurate than the AR or the M16, but you see all of these engagements take place at point blank to like 100 yards at most in this film. Trejo's AK would have been minute of man accurate at these ranges and would send an absolute 7.62 caliber shitstorm downrange. I've accuracy tested cheap surplus AKs and cheap ammo for this channel in the past, and they punch out better than three inch groups. The worst group for it was three or three and a half inches, but I also uh, managed to put down a few uh, two, two and a half inch groups with the Yugo. There's a strong argument to be made that even with as little screen time as this gun gets, the AK is the ideal long gun for downtown LA bank robberies. Oh yeah, the 1997 North Hollywood shootout again. The bank robbers in that case were using the Norinco Type 56 illegally converted to fully fun mode, and they held the entire LAPD at bay for 44 minutes, firing 1,100 rounds in the process. Both men were using Norinco Type 56s just like Trejo. Now moving to the next gun on the list, we have... Ah, don't you hate it whenever you're making a list video? and you've been rambling for near a half hour and you realize you totally forgot one of the guns a while back. I mean, a while back. Super cringe and annoying detective Hannah played perfectly by super cringe and annoying Al Pacino. She got a great ass. And you got your head all the way up it. Uses the FN FNC during the bank heist climax of the film. FN FNC, more like FN WTF, am I right? Huh? The FNC is an unsuccessful Belgian attempt at making a budget M16, developed in the 1970s to compete in NATO trials to select a standardized weapon platform. It was withdrawn from the trials because it sucked so badly. Not even kidding, Google it. Why would Pacino use the FNC? Fans of the film believe that the 1911 he used was. Chosen as a nod to Pacino's service, Hannah's service with the Marines, because that's the gun he would have used as a Marine. So if that's the case, then why, instead of an M16 that was adopted by the U.S. military in the 1960s, is Hannah using a weird, shitty budget version of the M16 that was adopted by the armed forces of Tonga? That makes zero sense. I don't even know what continent Tonga's on. I don't recall the LAPD ever issuing an FNFNC at any time, meaning this would be a personally owned weapon or a POW. All of the other cops in the movie use M16s. Not only would Hannah's gun have no parts compatibility with every other cop on the force, but there's a 90% chance that the LAPD would get sued every time he shot anyone with it for negligent use of a non-standardized weapon system by a cringy, coked up detective with no formal training on the gun. The FNC has a shitty trigger, no bolt hold open, a magwell tighter than a duck's asshole, it weighs three pounds heavier than the Colt Commando, and it flings brass into the next zip code. I'm glad that FN FNC has two Fs in it because if I could give it two Fs, I would. Give me a shotgun over this pile of shit. Moving to the top dog or dogs, ideally, I would take the Colt Commando used by Shaherlis and Macaulay. The two dopest dudes in the movie appropriately both have the two dopest guns in the movie. 
During the bank heist scene, both men are using Colt 733s, aka Commandos. These are full auto M16s with shortened barrels and collapsible butt stocks, making the total package very compact but still effective, at least at the ranges we're talking about. The 5.56 round used by the Commando is more suited to a full auto than any other long gun in the film. Those of you who have fired the AR-15 or M16, and for the love of God, I hope that's almost all of you, understand that the M16 is lightweight, but has almost non-existent recoil. The round's already light recoil impulse is further dampened by a robust recoil spring and buffer system with a simple and lightweight bolt carrier group that doesn't have a piston. I know, cue the annoying pedantic assholes who are going to call the bolt a piston and insist that the M16 is a piston gun. No, it's not. The round used by the AK-47 might be more powerful at the distances seen in the film, but the Commando makes up for it with volume and accuracy. Speaking to that, fully loaded Stainag magazines with 30 rounds of 5.56 are much lighter and smaller than fully loaded mags for the AK, the Galil, or any of the 308 guns. That means, as the men demonstrate in the film, it's easy to carry two or three hundred rounds worth of magazines on your person, even under a jacket, concealed, and it wouldn't affect your mobility as much as, say, the other guns. The Commando itself is lightweight, just a tick over five pounds. While it doesn't have a folding stock, the collapsing stock is very handy, as the men demonstrate while using the guns in the getaway car. Yes, this movie is fiction, but the actors aren't faking spatial physics when they're seen whipping these guns all around the inside of the getaway vehicle like it's a can of new car smell Febreze. Not only is the Colt Commando nimble, but the manual of arms from the M16 family is ergonomic as well. These guns are just easy to use, as designed by God and Eugene Stoner. Famously, Val Kilmer executes a flawless combat reload behind cover, and this scene is shown to new recruits in the military and law enforcement as the correct way to do it. There are also several other variants of the M16, including the Colt 654, which is similar to the Commando with a longer barrel, and a regular-ass M16A1 and A2. At that point, I would think an experienced combatant would probably take a Type 56 AK-47 over the M16. Oh, wait. Oh. Oh no, oh no, never mind. They wouldn't. Sorry about that. I had to do it. I had to do it. Thanks as usual for watching. That's it for Guns of Heat for this series. And if you think the AK 47 is better than the AR 15, you can suck my big fat. <laughs>